Hi, Celeste. Thank you for joining us. Um, let's start with you live in Rio. How many? Give us give us a ballpark figure here. How many athletes are competing uh, for other countries other than those of their birth at this Olympics? Do we have any idea? Well, Rama, what we know here is that the IAAF Athletics uh, World Governing Body cleared 85 athletes to compete for different for different nationalities other than their country of birth. 12 of those, of course, from Bahrain. And many of these uh, are actually Kenyan. At least almost uh, more than 10 here competing here are Kenyan of um, birth, but are competing for an adopted nation, Rama. So there's also athletes who are um, away from the individual sport. There are a number of athletes competing in team sports who are not uh, from, the, from their country, who are, um, have adopted nations, Rama. And it is, it is quite um, an, a number that is increasing over the years because for the last five years, Rama, the figure is put at 300 athletes who compete internationally, either the Olympics or major international competitions who have changed nationality from their country of birth to adopted nations, Rama. Right. Uh, Martin, you're in studio. Um, is where it, at face value, it seems like Kenya is a, an interesting export destination, for lack of a better word. We're exporting talent uh, to other countries. But as Celeste mentioned, the trend is growing, but in aggregate, is it just Kenya that's affected or are we seeing this in other countries in Africa as well? Uh, well, there's plenty of countries uh, who have exported athletes to, um, uh, to other countries, Nigeria being one of them. And basically Kenyans, there's about 30 Kenyans uh, who are competing for other countries. And in total, uh, around, you know, around the Olympics, 80, 80 athletes have transferred their nationalities. Yeah. Uh, you see majority of the sprinters um, uh, running for Bahrain, coming from Nigeria, some also from, from Jamaica. Mm -hmm. So there's not only Kenya that's doing this, you know, it's, it's other countries around Africa and um, the rest of the world. I'm going to come to both of you here, mm -hmm. Celeste. Let's start with you. Technically, there's nothing illegal about switching a nationality in order to compete for another country, is there? Oh, no, there's nothing illegal, Rama. Look, it is uh, freedom for, for all. It is a choice. Um, what the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, however, dictates, the rule is that for you to compete for an adopted nation, you must have competed internationally at global events for at least three years for that particular country. And that is why certain athletes, for example, the 3,000 meter steeplechase world record holder, Saif Shaheen, who was formerly Stephen Cherono of Kenya, could not compete at the Olympics when he switched nationality because after the three-year laps, he couldn't qualify, he got injured, and he n never managed to compete at the Olympic Games, despite the fact that he was a very talented runner. So the IAAF has its own rules as well. Sometimes they tend to fast-track uh, the changing of nationality. FIFA, for example, will not allow you to compete for another uh, country once you have competed for a nation as a senior player. So the rules vary, of course, depending on the international federation, but generally, Rama, there's nothing illegal about it. You just go through the paperwork. Once you've got it, you get your, your clear pass and you get your passport. Um, Martin, coming to you, I mean, sports management is your business. So if, if hypothetically, if one of your athletes comes to you and says, I would like to run for Qatar, Bahrain, whatever, what's, what's, what sort of legal hurdles do you have to jump through to make that happen? Uh, well, first of all, I think, you know, we have to find out if the athlete has represented Kenya before because that's usually a hurdle that we have to overcome. Uh, they may have to sit out uh, a period, a certain period, uh, whether it's two years or, or four years, which they're pushing for now, uh, mm -hmm. that they have to sit out not competing for the other country immediately because it's unfair really to the country of origin for these athletes to immediately jump ship and run you know, in the next race. Mm -hmm. you know, so there's, there, is, there are some legal hurdles, some um, things they have to go through before they actually run uh, certified to run for the next country. Um, but does the country of origin have any veto right over these athletes switching nationalities? They used to. Uh, they used to. I think that rule has changed now. I mean, a perfect example was uh, Said Shaif Shaheen or Stephen Chirono yeah. uh, back in 2004 mm. uh, when he was running for, he ran for Qatar in 2003, uh, but uh, the National Olympic Committee didn't allow him to run uh, for Qatar the following year in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. So that issue was there before. I think now if it's just, it's not a veto really, you just have to sit out. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, Celeste, coming to you in Rio, I mean, when, when Ruth Chibet uh, won the, uh, the, the steeplechase event uh, a little earlier in the Olympics, there was a really angry reaction from some Kenyans uh, over here. What was the reaction like 
in Rio for you? I mean, presumably you had a first hand uh, a front row seat really to all these uh, to all this unfolding drama. What was the reaction over there? Well, Rama, the reaction was exactly the same as we, we have seen when uh, other athletes have been winning globally in athletics for uh, adopted nations. The press was brutal to the, to the adopted countries. The press claiming that certain countries are buying talent, and that is not fair because uh, they feel like you cannot match the, some countries' financial muscle. And look, for the Kenyans who are here, they, they, they really did not feel very betrayed. There was a feeling, a sense of betrayal among Kenyans on, on social media that this could have been a Kenyan goal. But again, remember, this is a lady who switched allegiance first when she was a youngster. And the reasons for her switching allegiance is where there's a bit of an issue. It's not just about the thousands of dollars that people talk about that she says uh, that people say she's getting. She also said that she was not, she didn't, wasn't allowed enough um, opportunity in Kenya, considering the amount of depth there is in this country. So of course, the reaction here has been that Bahrain, Qatar, and all the other countries who are able to get adopted, to get athletes to, to change nationality, are buying talent, which is unfair. And so even the IWF is looking into the rules of what they're calling transfer of allegiance because of these reactions here, Rama. Right, Martin, but I mean, what, what, how do we define what is fair? I mean, we're looking at a, an economy where talent can be freely traded across the board. We don't raise an eyebrow when mm -hmm. Manchester United spends hundreds of millions of dollars buying an Italian player or a German player or player from Senegal or wherever, but now we're making noise about it in athletics. So how do we define fair, quote-unquote? Well, I think uh, we have to understand, you know, why this, uh, these passions are being stoked here. Uh, this is the Olympic Games, which means a great deal to Kenyans. Mm -hmm. Uh, the fact that Ruth Chebet defeated uh, Haivin Kieng, yes. a former country uh, woman, mm -hmm. in, a, in an event as passionate with, with Kenyans, steeplechase, yeah. uh, definitely stoked emotions. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of people were emotional because of that. Mm -hmm. But I think once you, once you explain to them, understand that, listen, um, the, the reason why she changed nationalities is that she, she probably wouldn't have had a chance to make the team um, here in Kenya before. Mm -hmm. But given the opportunities, given the, the right training environment, given the right support by the country uh, she's moved to, she's excelling, you know, and we as Kenyans have to appreciate that. And so it's, it's definitely different from, um, from the English Premier League where players are bought um, from different countries, but they don't represent those countries at, at the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. And the Olympic Games comes once in four years. And it's very important to a lot of these countries, particularly for us in Kenya, <laughs> that uh, a former Kenyan beats a Kenyan in yeah. our race. You know, and that's, that's what's that's what really still it's, emotions. It's a, it's a fascinating discussion all Indeed. the same. Um, Celeste, let me come to something that you mentioned a little earlier. The issue of the sort of support that these athletes actually do get in terms of training. We've seen a ton of press here about how uh, the Kenyan National Olympic Committee has made an absolute mess of managing athletes uh, in this particular Olympics. We've seen similar reports about Nigeria, for instance. I mean, given all these stories, if, if countries treat their athletes badly, we shouldn't be surprised if they decide to switch allegiances, should we? Should we? Well, definitely, of course, Rama, uh, when it comes to sports administration, Africa doesn't really have the best examples doing. But um, the fact that uh, sports administration is run poorly in Africa, really, in my opinion, isn't really the biggest number one reason why they even transfer allegiance. Because, you see, for most of these athletes, it always often comes down to the depth of talent within a country that they feel like they cannot make it, as Martin said. But yes, Rama, the sports administration isn't helping. In fact, there have been allegations within Kenya itself that certain agents, certain uh, local coaches even help these athletes to, to change allegiance. For they, they act almost as middlemen and get something out of it. Um, so whether that is true or not, Rama, of course, um, that's for, for investigators to, to find out. But it is really a sad state of affairs because sometimes also you find that when a name pops up in Qatar or Bahrain or the Middle East or anywhere in the world and, a Ken and Kenyans go like, oh, that, used to, that is a runner. Where did he run? Where? So the, even the database is non-existent of Kenyan athletes as they come up through the ranks. So sometimes athletes who are very talented like Ruth slip through the, the ranks without anybody noticing, all because administration isn't well done in in, in, in most African countries, Rama. Uh, right. I'm going to read a quote here from uh, Jabet's manager a little earlier. Now we're coming to the money question. Um, 
he pointed out, this is uh, Charles Kilonzo, I believe, uh, her manager, he pointed out that this is also a win for a bank balance because uh, Japan is going to be paid the equivalent of about half a million dollars compared to the 10,000 that her countrymen are going to be earning for a similar win. Um, Martin, coming to you, I mean, how big a motivator here is money? I mean, is it 90-20 in terms of facilities versus the potential earnings here? Well, it's huge. It's huge for the athletes and, you know, uh, particularly for young athletes like, athletes like Ruth Chabet. You know, when you move to a country and you're promised, you know, huge rewards, uh, you, you're not going to think twice about, you know, where your allegiance is going to lie. You're going to make that move fairly quickly. So, yeah, it, it, you know, uh, the monetary rewards plays a big part because an athlete's career is re it has a short lifespan of maybe maximum 10 years. You know, and you've got to make the most of it in that period. So, um, yeah, so the motivation is really uh, monetary. Mm -hmm. um, Celeste, coming to you, we, we've covered the cash side of things. We've covered uh, the, the training and administration side of things. But after that career is over and you've got this dual nationality, then what? Do we have any successful instances of athletes who've changed nationality and have had a successful career off the track or off the field? Well, actually, uh, when you look at especially Kenyan athletes who have changed nationality and had successful careers for their adopted nation, one of them, of course, the best example really here is Saif Shah, informally Stephen Chirono. We've spoken about him, the 3,000 meters steeplechase world record holder. He actually came back home. He said he got to a point when, uh, whenever he, he wasn't competing anymore, and he almost felt superfluous to the <laughs> to the needs of, of his adopted nation so and he was more comfortable coming back home to leave home there are others actually whose citizenship has been revoked sometimes like leonard Mosheru, his citizenship was revoked because he said something wrong to the press and his country or uh, his adopted nation wasn't happy with him anymore mm -hmm. so rama really once um, it's almost like a, like a business contract once your work is done for us you can live where you want some of them of course their contracts say they get a monthly stipend of at least a thousand dollars that is what was uh, given to Saif promised rather to Saif Shahin whether he's getting it we cannot tell uh, and so you could get the monetary uh, benefits for a lifetime like a pension but for many athletes many of these athletes they actually tend to come back home also the ones who are already competing for them do live back in Kenya most of them Ruth Chabet is always in in, in Eldoret and around the 10 Eunice Kiru as well the silver medalist from from um, the marathon the women's marathon here so Rama it is I think also the dual nationality with Kenya is helping most of these athletes right well I'm going to wrap this up um, the IOC and the WAF have uh, or rather let me start with the IOC one of its former officials uh, has expressed his dislike of this uh, particular practice but as you both mentioned it's mostly a question of Sovereignty. Martin, I'm going to start with you. Is this something that the IWF or the IOC can put an end to in terms of this business of exporting and buying, quote unquote, talent? I don't think they can put an end to it because there are many different circumstances in which athletes change nationalities. Um, for example, uh, there's six athletes representing the U.S. who are former Kenyans, and they, their circumstances are very different from the ones who uh, moved to Bahrain to run for them, uh, or Turkey, or Serbia, or Israel. You know, some, like even lo former athlete uh, Lona Kiplagat was married to a Dutchman and yeah. got her, her nationality. So in that sense, it's difficult to put an end to those circumstances. Uh, well, for example, the commercial, the commercial sense, I mean, really, if they can sit out, um, if, they, if they sit out the two years, uh, that is the rule. Uh, there's really nothing legal about that. You know, I don't think, you know, and everybody's re really looking for uh, opportunities through sport or business or uh, different facets of society to, to better their lives. And, you know, if, if that means moving to another country to seek better, uh, seek a, a be better pastures for their, for their careers, so be it. I don't think it's a, I don't think it can be stopped. You know, I think um, even now going forward, you know, other countries are going to find it difficult to, um, to attract even more athletes coming for, uh, to run for them because of this. 
you know, and so I, I believe that it's difficult to, to really put a stop to. Uh, it's, it's unfair to the, you know, to the countries, that, to the athletes they're moving to, and maybe it can be looked at as a positive way, that they, yeah. can, enco they can be used to encourage, uh, you know, sort of the natives to, to take up uh, sport at a higher level, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I don't think it should be perceived as negatively by the IOC right. or IWF. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Celeste, final word to you. Is this something that IOC and the IWF are looking at and thinking, eh, perhaps we need to put a stop to this or maybe regulate it a little better? Uh, well, the IWF has said it. Uh, IWF President Sebastian Coe said they are having a meeting, a council meeting on Saturday, and they are going to look into this issue of transfer of allegiance. What the IWF wants to do is that they want to make the athletes who are changing um, nationality, because it is really very huge, especially in athletics, is they want to make them show commitment to the adopted nation. And this means that, like Martin says, the waiting period or the, the, the duration you have to sit out for you to compete for that country in international competition or regional competitions before you can be allowed maybe to a world championships or an olympics could just be increased but that is all really they can do rama because um it's it, like like martin says you can't really it, the circumstances differ and so it will actually be case by case scenarios but what the IWF is doing is they are going to relook really at those rules. The IOC already has a three-year waiting period in place that for you to show commitment to this adopted nation, and then you can compete. And again, Rama, it's business. Anything worth competing for is worth paying for. Indeed, absolutely. Thank you very much for your input. Celestine Carineo, sports editor in Cairo, and of course, Martin Kano here in studio. You guys have been awesome on this. Thank you.